Here's what you're missing over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, patrons. How are you? Good. Great to hear it. Um, today, we are talking with our friend Brad Gottfried uh, about uh, one of his latest. It's not the latest, right? You said it is, uh, but it is a recent one, 2022. Right. That's right. Um, as you just told me, you uh, wrote it during the pandemic mm-hmm. while the rest of us were getting fat and doing nothing. Uh, well, you I got, were actually I got fat and wrote it. So <laughs> well, there you go. At least you were productive there. Uh, it's called Lee Invades the North, a comparison of the Antietam and Gettysburg campaigns. And uh, I think this is great because it, it they're they're very similar, at least in their origins, right? Oh, uh, yes. Lee's coming up in both cases for the same reason, essentially. Yeah, for the most part. There, there are some differences, and that's what I really wanted to get into. Mm-hmm. Where, they're, uh, where they're similar, where they're different. And, you know, it, what I like about it, Although I shouldn't say that because it sounds terrible. You're right. What I like, like about my own book. I dislike most of the stuff, but what I do like about it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. But it gets into, like, for instance, the very beginning. What were the politics? You know, what was the military situation um, right before the Maryland campaign, right before the Gettysburg campaign? How did it shift? You know, how did it change? Um, why did Lee invade? Mm-hmm. You know, and again, similar, but uh, a lot of differences. And, you know, getting into the armies and you think about it. Well, Lee had an army that was double the size um, at Gettysburg compared to what he had at Antietam. Right. Thirty six thousand guys versus seventy, seventy five thousand. And you would expect he would have a much larger array of units. But he actually has nine divisions, both campaigns. Mm hmm. And it's act- it's what, what's fascinating is the number of regiments he has actually goes down at Gettysburg. And you're saying, wait a minute, how can he have double the number of guys in the ranks, and yet he has fewer regiments at Gettysburg? Well, it makes sense, because at Antietam, some of those regiments had 40, 30, 100 guys, where at Gettysburg, they're going to have three, 400. So he bulks up the regiments, and he's going to have fewer of them. Uh, w- w- was it another thing going into Antietam that a lot of guys said, well, I fought to defend not to invade, and they stayed on their side of the Potomac. Yeah, that's true. Uh, do we do we have an idea of what percentage of the army didn't go over? I d- I don't think we have that. Okay. But, but Lee was pretty explicit. You know, if if you don't want to come, don't come. And one of the things that uh, I talk about is the problem with stragglers in both cases. Right. And Lee is very explicit. If you don't want to fight, if you don't want to be in this army, I don't want you. So yeah, out of here. Right. Not 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 you can take a break, but out. Out. You're out, right. out. Right. Yeah. But when you think about it, you know, it comes on the heels of second bull run. Right. In fact, we're talking Chantilly is on um, September the 1st, 1863, uh, 62, excuse me. He's marching up to Leesburg. He gets there on the 3rd. You know, most times you're going to have the two armies licking their wounds after. Mm -hmm. But he's moving fast after. Mm -hmm. And what happens is he's moving so fast that he's he's losing a lot of guys. And one of the things he decided, we do know this, he left about 5,000 men at um, Leesburg. Mm -hmm. He said, if you don't have shoes... You're staying behind because we're going to move fast. And and unlike um, a lot of the roads here in, in Virginia, he's saying, when we get into Maryland, when we get into Pennsylvania, we're going to be on McAdam Maca- uh, roads. And if you don't have shoes or if shoes are about ready to fall apart, forget it because you're not going to be able to keep up. Hmm. And if you can't keep up, the Yankees are going to capture you. And I don't want that to happen. So, um, so he has a number of guys that are falling out of the ranks. Uh, one, because they're left behind. Two, as you said, because, wait a minute, you know, I signed up to defend my homeland. Why are we invading the North? And then those who are crossing, you know, he thought and they thought, oh, all this food, we're going to get all these supplies, green corn, green apples, ugh, indigestion, fallen by the side of the road, forced marches. I mean, when you think about McClaws's, Lafayette McClaws's division and Richard Anderson's division, they're marching all night from Harper's Ferry. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, they leave just after nightfall. All night, they get to the battlefield at at, at uh, Sharpsburg. Um, McClaws gets there earlier. He, they let them rest for about half an hour. Anderson, 
They get there about 10 o'clock. It's no rest. Get right into the sunken road. You got to get right into action. So, you know, the army was in much worse shape at Antietam, the, the, the Confederate army, than it was at Gettysburg. Well, did they have a good take at least? Did they come home with a lot of stuff? Not at Antietam. No. Because there just wasn't enough time. I mean, you think about it. They get to Frederick, oh, probably about the uh, 7th and 8th of September. And then, you know, one of the controversies of the Antietam camp, lots of controversies. Sure. But one of the controversies is why did Lee decide to stop the invasion? Because he was heading to Pennsylvania. He had a clear shot. He could have gotten up there, might have even been able to take Harrisburg, because McClellan, who commands the Union Army, is still reorganizing it down in, in, get, in Washington. <laughs> right. Too many, too many names. <laughs> and he decides, nope, 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 Harper's Ferry, I've got to go over there, I've got to capture that garrison or drive it away. And he uses as an excuse, well, they're in my line of communications, which is going to be the Shenandoah Valley. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, well, if I'm going north, I don't want that garrison in my rear. Right. I think, how do you bypass 13,000 Yanks that you can capture? There are about, about 50 cannon. There are thousands and thousands of arms, small arms, mm. you know, hundreds of thousands of, of rounds of ammunition. I mean, they love coffee. They're not getting enough coffee. 5,000 pounds of coffee. Yeah. And so it was a way to get supplies okay. for the most yeah. part. So, but for the most part, the army, when it finally gets to get come together, it's, it's going to be uh, the 16th and actually the morning of the 7th. There's not enough time. And one of the things, and I love the book, um, you know, um, Kent Brown's book yeah. on Meade and the, especially his retreat book. Right. Uh, one of the things that um, most people don't realize was even during the Battle of Gettysburg, those quartermasters are are all around the area pulling in tons and tons of supplies. Sure. Even during the retreat. Sure. When the wagons are being attacked by uh, Kilpatrick's cavalry, they still have the wagons <laughs> and they have... They have each they have a each regiment, I believe, had a company that was thrown out, and it's it's marching next to the army, but it's pulling in all these supplies. Right, right. So they got a lot of supplies during the Gettysburg sure. campaign, which was what he wanted to do. But also, he's uh, he doesn't want to plunder Maryland because he's trying to uh, ingratiate this the South to. The, the Southern sympathizers in Maryland, right? Well, I think you find that in both cases. Uh-huh. Because... Well, yeah, right, because it's a border state. Well, that, but also when you, uh, during the Pennsylvania campaign, the same kind of thing. You know, I'm a town guide, Gettysburg mm -hmm. licensed town guide, and one of the things I always talk about is you're a civilian. Okay, you know Lee is coming. Do you stay or do you leave? Mm. And most people are going to say, oh, I'm leaving. I'm yeah. not going to stay. And then I say, but... What you don't know and what they didn't know is he enacts two orders that says to his troops, we do not steal, we do not plunder, we do not hurt civilians. This is a war that is of the military, to mm -hmm. the military, not civilians, not like Sherman later on. And and part of it was because of the goodwill, you're right, that he couldn't afford for the, the northern population, which is kind of teetering at both years, you know, do we want to continue that 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 fight right and you think about when lincoln came you know here lincoln comes um he had a sick child he does he's already lost two children mm -hmm. so he's got a, a kid potentially uh tad who's on his deathbed with a form of uh smallpox variola and wife is very mad at him about this he's got he's up to his neck in all this work you know he doesn't have the kind of aids that we presidents right. have today and he still comes to Gettysburg. Why? It wasn't because he wanted to see the battlefield. It was because he felt compelled to tell the nation why we must continue to fight, mm -hmm. that we can't give this up. And so, you know, even back then, you know, in 1863, he's still worried about union sentiment and, and is it going to start to change? And he's very worried about the 1864 campaign mm. because he needed, when Grant comes in, he needed these major victories. So it looked like the end was near because the union, for, uh, the people in the union would not 
allow this war to go on in, indefinitely. You know, there had to be an end point. Um, so you, the, the way you have this book uh, set up is uh, pretty good. I think it's great. Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> uh, part one is why the invasion and preparation. Uh, part two, getting to the battlefield. Yes. Part three, the major battles of the campaigns. Part four, after the battles, end of the campaigns. And uh, within them are several chapters about, I mean, a lot of stuff. There's a, a lot, lot of, stuff. of stuff. Now, these are mostly short chapters, though. They are. Right? Which which is nice. And, it, you know, it's not, like I said before, it's not um, Coddington. We're not getting bogged down with, uh, you know, mm -hmm. minutia and details. Right. But there are... A lot of things in here that um, make it easier to compare the two or just yes. understand what was going on with both. Right. Um, and so we decided for this, the purposes of this interview, to focus on chapter four. Yeah, the which, toughest one, by the way. <laughs> is it? <laughs> it toughest is one tough. to write or understand? No, both. Really? Yeah, it was tough. Why? Well, there's so much um, detail here. For instance, you know, you, you look at, well, we'll talk about straggling. Yeah. And... You know, you get into McClellan had specific orders against straggling. Lee had specific orders. Actually, he had two separate orders right. against straggling. Um, so I'm saying, okay, I said to Linda, oh, I hope he doesn't get into real detail on what each of these orders um, meant and said. Whereas um, during the, the Pennsylvania campaign, the Gettysburg campaign, you didn't find any of these orders. Now, there was less straggling during that period. Right. Uh, now, but... In uh, the in, uh, didn't Meade have an order? I, I don't know if it was against straggling, but didn't he just basically say you can shoot anybody who doesn't do his job? That I'm not aware of. Uh, uh, coming up here, I mean, you know, yeah. to Gettysburg. Well, you know, he's he's coming into command just uh, a few days before the battle, mm -hmm. and he doesn't know what's really happening. He doesn't even know where his army is. Right. You know, that's how horrible it is. Which is why that makes sense. You know, I, I don't know what's going on, but we can't afford stragglers. Instead of this detailed order, just shoot anybody who doesn't do his you job. Know, <laughs> maybe, maybe I. Yeah. Well, that's okay. not in the book. But that's not in the book, no. <laughs> no. All right. So, but with the, the Maryland campaign, you're talking, though, about straggling. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. So, can, can finish your thought there. Okay. So... One of the major differences, and it really plays itself out very well in a number of different ways, is how the what happened between the battle before, the campaign before, and the Antietam and Gettysburg campaigns. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, in terms of um, the Antietam campaign, there was so little time between battles. So you think about these Confederates, Union troops— um, those from the Army of the, of the Potomac who were way down in the in the peninsula, you know, they're coming up for, and so is Lee's Army, they're coming up to fight outside of Washington. And there is so little time between the end of the Second Bull Run campaign and Antietam, you know, the Battle of Antietam. Right. We're talking, I mean, we're talking less than three weeks. Mm -hmm. These guys are tired. You know, in the book, I get into some of these quotes where they get into how even the Union, we usually think the Union troops are well supplied and they've got lots of food. No, mm -hmm. um, you know, because the supply chain just couldn't catch up with them. Whereas at Gettysburg, a whole different animal. Chancellorsville, which comes before, is fought the beginning of May. Lee doesn't start moving until the 3rd, 4th of June. So you've got a month for these troops to be resupplied, just to lay in their tents and relax. Re and Recover, and, yeah. 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 Major difference. Right. In terms of how the, what the condition of the troops were. And I think one of the reasons that you didn't find a lot of straggling, because they, they were in better shape. Now, on Lee's side, though, the men are still starving. They're still not getting the food they need. Yeah. But at least when they started marching, they would march, they would stop for a while for a variety of reasons, then they would go for a while, then they would stop in both cases. Yeah. So intense marches, stop for a few days, continue to march. Um, at Antietam, when, when Lee started moving, it was pretty intense for the whole time, especially think of, about Stonewall Jackson, where he has six of his nine divisions leaving Frederick. And Lee says, oh, I'm an optimist. Well, he didn't say that, but he was an optimist. But he's enacting Special Orders 191, which divides up his army. Right. So he wants to capture uh, Harper's Ferry. He says, okay, the army's going to get in motion on the 10th, but not to worry because Harper's Ferry is going to fall by the 12th 
Well, there's no way that it could have fallen. And these guys are marching like. Listen to the rest of this interview and dozens like it. Support the show and get early access to special episodes, early and discounted ticket sales, and more. The second lieutenant level and above gets access to all monthly Patreon episodes. So please go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg, choose a tier, and join. And I thank you in advance.